to present Brendan Slocum and the Violin Conspiracy. Thank you for coming. Uh, today is one of many events this year. The Boyd House is celebrating 100 years this year, and it's a celebration, a year-long celebration we're calling the Weymouth Wonderful 100. And this is one of 100 events that we're putting on this year. I have a few more to tell you about coming up in the next month. But I wanted to put today's event in time for you. We're in the great room here in the Boyd House. And as I shared, the Boyd House is celebrating 100 years this year. It was the home of James Boyd and Catherine Boyd. James Boyd was a very famous and noted author of Revolutionary War novels, the most famous of which are Drums and Marching On. If you have time after today's event, Please do visit the library, the Boyd Library. And it, uh, this home is a very special place in terms of literature. We are home to the North Carolina Literary Hall of Fame. So if you'd like to go upstairs, which I'm pretty sure Brendan might be a member of some this good. <laughs> uh, so for North Carolina writers, they, we honor, we team up with the North Carolina Writers Network and the North Carolina Humanities Council as a coordinating committee to name. Uh, award winners every two years who join the North Carolina Literary Hall of Fame, and we have the hall upstairs, so I hope you'll visit it. Um, also wanted to let you know that this room has been a place of creativity and conversation, much like what you're going to hear today. James Boyd would host his friends and other noted authors like F. Scott Fitzgerald, William Faulkner, Sherwood Anderson, uh, Paul Green here in conversation and host creative readings and so just know that you're part of a long line of literature and the arts and conversation here at Weymouth. Uh, we have a couple of really exciting programs coming up as part of our 100 years. Following today, I hope you'll join us back here on March 9th for Live from the Great Room. That'll be a jazz performance with Ryan Keverly and Catharsis, a jazz quartet. That's presented in partnership with the Rooster's Wife, with Janet here. Everybody knows Janet. Then on March 12th, the women of Weymouth are hosting a St. Patrick's Day warm up. So come and join us for a St. Patrick's Day lunch, as it's also a fundraiser for Weymouth. March 13th is our Arts and Humanities lecture. We're hosting part two of Freedom Park, North Carolina Freedom Park. We're building a major monument to the Black experience in North Carolina and the freedom movement in North Carolina. It's called Freedom Park. And we'll hear from Reginald Hildebrand and Reginald Hodges, two of the board members of the North Carolina Freedom Park Movement. Um, March 27th, Shauna Tucker is a jazz cellist and singer-songwriter. She's got a Come Sunday brunch here, so come and have brunch. We finally have a brunch partner, thank God, the Marketplace in Pinehurst is going to team up with us. You can get your brunch from the Marketplace and hear some wonderful jazz music on the 27th. And then back here, April 1st, if you like bluegrass, then I, we call this new grass, which is like a little jivier, faster, more rock, hip hop, fusion bluegrass. That'll be uh, April 1st at 7 p.m. with Brittany Haas. She's a world uh, award winning, worldwide famous fiddler, also a Rooster's Wife production um, here in the great room. That's April 1st at 7. Come to know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> We're doing a little experiment in your chairs. You'll have found an audience survey. We spend a lot of money trying to get people to find out about our events, and we'd like to know which ways are really working. And so if you wouldn't mind filling out, if you remember how you found out about today's event, and we're just going to start tracking where we're putting our marketing dollars to make sure that we're getting the most impact. So thank you for that. It's my pleasure to introduce Kimberly. Yes. One more thing. Yes. The um, North Carolina Poetry Society meets here. That's right. We are home to the Zooming. <laughs> That's right. Which is a wonderful reminder. Thank you. We're home to the North Carolina Poetry Society. Oh, wow. okay. And I have a gift for Brendan today, which is a published book of 18 poems by James Boyd. Oh, wow. Oh, thank you. Nice. Thank you so much. So 
my pleasure to introduce Kimberly Daniels with the Country Bookshop. Thank you. Well, welcome. Um, I'm going to do another introduction just to get everyone so ready for our conversation to start. Um, I want to begin by thanking each one of you for being here. Um, with today to welcome Brendan Slocum to Southern Highlands. Um, the Country Bookshop, we're part of the town for one reason and, and one reason only, and that's because y'all choose to shop with us. Um, we hope that you're proud to shop with us. We hope that, that you like us being there, whether it's meeting, you know, Good Morning America's book club pick on the books. <laughs> You find it interesting that we partner with schools and get books in kids' hands in Moore County and in our, all of our surrounding counties. Um, we're just like having a place to entertain your family when they visit. Um, but we thank you for finding value in us and, and shopping with us because that's literally the only reason we're here. Um, uh, the Country Bookshop was founded by two women in 1953 who had several incredible owners over the years. And in 2010, when we were gonna close our doors, the Pilot newspaper bought us. Um, and if you have not visited us in downtown Southern Pines, please do. Uh, we really enjoy being a part of your lives. Um, Danita Nocton, whose birthday is today. Um, it's a joy to, to be a part of our community. Now, I'm going to introduce Brittany Slope, and it is also a long introduction, but y'all are going to bear with me. Uh, Brendan Slocum was born in Yuba City, California, and raised in Fayetteville, North Carolina. He now lives in Washington, D.C., and is a graduate of the University of North Carolina in Greensboro with a degree in music and education and concentrations in violin and viola. While at UNCG, Brendan was concert master for the University Symphony Orchestra and served as its principal violinist. He performed with numerous small chamber ensembles, including flute and clarinet choirs, and in the BESK string quartet. For the past 23 years, he has been a public and private school music educator, from kindergarten through 12th grade, teaching general music, orchestra, and guitar ensembles. His students were also often chosen for district and regional orchestras. In 2005, Brendan was named Teacher of the Year for, at Robert E. Lee High School and has been named to Who's Who of American Teachers, is a Nobel Teacher of Distinction, and also serves as an educational consultant for the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. As a musician, Brendan has performed on violin with the Washington Metropolitan Symphony, the McLean Symphony, Prince George's Philharmonic, and the Alexandra Symphony. He currently serves as concert master for the Nova and Annandale Symphony Orchestra. Brendan has been a frequent adjudicator and guest conductor for several district and regional orchestras throughout North Carolina and Virginia. He also performs chamber music, excuse me, with members of the Annandale Symphony. He maintains a private music studio teaching lessons to students on violin, guitar, and piano. He founded the nonprofit organization Hands Across the Sea, based in the Philippines, after touring with the, the Philippines with the Northern Virginia Chamber Ensemble and witnessing firsthand the conditions that many young music students and their families endure. So now, the students of Berea School of the Arts in Manila are provided instruments, lessons, and monetary support. Hands Across the Sea also supplements school supplies dental and medical assistance. In his spare time, <laughs> Brendan enjoys writing, exercising, and collecting comic books and action figures, and performing with his rock band, Geppetto's Wood. Music, this is the last little bit, but music has always played a major part of Brendan's life. He believes that it's a life-saving force and a gift we should always offer our children. When he was nine, he started playing violin through a public school music program. It actually saved his life. Friends he grew up with are today sitting in jail when they were out running the streets, he was in rehearsals. When they were breaking into people's houses, he was practicing Dvorak and Mozart. His violin opened the door to opportunity and he ran through it. The Violent Conspiracy was written in 2020 and published this month. 
Screen rights for the violin conspiracy have gone to Sony with director George Tillman Jr. of the Hate You Give attached. And the book has been selected as an Indie Next book. As I mentioned, a Good Morning America GMA book club pick. The book has been highly anticipated in publications across the nation and has received glowing reviews from the Washington Post, the New York Times, and pretty much everywhere books are considered at all. Um, so welcome, welcome, thank you for joining us. Just telling us briefly the plot of the book, just a couple sentences. First, thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you for welcoming me. Thank you, Kimberly. Violent Conspiracy is a story of Ray who discovers that his old family fiddle is actually a priceless Stradivarius violin, and this discovery catapults him into superstar in the world of classical music. Right before the Tchaikovsky competition, think the Olympics of classical music, his instrument is stolen. Will he get it back? Will he get to compete? Who took it? Was it his family who wants him to sell the instrument and split the money? Is it the Marx family who are the descendants of the slave owner who owned Ray's great 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 grandfather? Was it them? Was it someone else? We don't know. The answer is in the book. <laughs> Obviously, a master communicator. Um, oh, wait. Um, you've got music performance, writing, and passion for teaching. And I'd like to begin by talking to you about the way you describe music. Um, for those of you who have not read the book, you are about to be in for such a treat. Uh, and I'm going to quote you just so y'all can understand what I'm asking about. Um, the mournful opening notes gave way to sunlight on a park bench, to the glitter of water pouring endlessly from a waterfall on a very hot summer day. Or, the melody started slow in the night, a plucking of strings, snowflakes falling dreamily one flake at a time, and then a burst of cold air poured down on them, and flakes eddied, budding in the chill, the north wind coursing through the living room. Dawn came, light glistening off a frozen pond, a bird flew down, hopped on a new stove, looking for seed. Bare trees reached to the sky, achingly blue in the cold. Skaters swirled on ice, skiers coasted down the long runs, then back to the house. To the warmth, to chocolate thawing on the stove and mitten steaming in front of the fire. He painted all this for them in the air. So did this way of describing music, which is incredible, um, Crystal asked for you kind of, as you were writing, or is that as you were teaching, always how you kind of turned it into words. That's really interesting. Um, as a musician, well, first, how many of you are musicians here? <laughs> I have my first lesson tomorrow. <laughs> 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 That's That's so for uh, when I initially wrote um, the music descriptions, I was thinking in terms of my own technical experience. Everything was in technical jargon. The staccatos were crisp, the legatos were this, and the, you know, the ricochets were. I let my non-musical friends read this and they were like, I don't know what any of this means. This is completely different, or even space, what is this? And so I had to go back and I had to think of it. What what would I, how would I describe it for someone who has no idea what I'm talking about? And as an educator, that's what we have to do. We have to take people where they are and take them to the next level. So I spent a lot of time coming up with metaphors. It's like, what is this like to me when I play this piece? What did it feel like? Oh, this feels like raindrops or snow or a bird, you know, hopping from branch to branch, or, you know, this is a cloudy section here. Um, so I really did a lot of experimentation with, you know, is this the, not only does this feeling uh, I'm trying to describe, it doesn't feel the same way it feels when I play this piece and when I listen to this piece. And when I went back and did the, the metaphorical um, descriptions, it made a lot more sense to the people that was, you know, people that read it. Like, oh yeah, this makes perfect sense now. Okay, well, I should have done that to start with. So I will do this every single time. And everything always starts off super technical. And then I bring it back to, Pardon my, you know, I don't mean to call anyone layman's, but bring it back to layman's non-musician terms. Well, you do. Oh, sorry. Well, you do. You translate. You do. <laughs> <laughs> but you translate it. I mean, you, and that's what comes across. And, and in your author's note, you talk about music being for everyone. And it's almost like you 
not even knowing that that was the process. I feel like that's what those words do. Um, the next thing I kind of want to talk about is the pacing, the tip. I mean, this is a thriller. It's tense tempo. The movement of the story is striking. It kind of builds and unfolds almost like a work of music, um, kind of hitting your emotions along the way. And then the way the chapters are outlined, it's like 10 months ago, four months ago, kind of has the effect of a ticking clock almost. And got this drumbeat of pressures, two lawsuits, all these performances and competitions and the media. And it's all these like strings of tension in the story and um, these just crushing blows. And then teachers bringing life and it's just brilliantly structured in terms of craft. But what I want to ask you is the, the blows that kind of create all the thrills and all the pain in the story um, are reflective of your specific experiences. And so I'm wondering if you, I have another question as well, but if you want, if you could talk to that a little bit. Sure, sure. Um, as far as the pacing is concerned, I wanted to write this like I was watching a movie. Uh, you know, I when I'm watching a movie or if I'm reading a book, I want to be entertained from start to finish. And as I was writing, I'm like, all right, what would I want to see next? I want a cliffhanger here. I want a real page turner. I want you to just you know turn the page before you're even done reading. I want you to be so excited about getting to the next next section. Of what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Edge your seat and then get pulled back. And then edge your seat again and then get pulled back. And just till it's it's just too much for you to handle. And that's the way I wanted to write it. And I'm hoping that it came across that way. I hope. Um, but pacing is so important. Jim and I were talking a little bit about about pacing and you know, it, it, it can make or break a book. You can have a fantastic story, but if pacing isn't, you know, if it's too slow at one point, you just you just lose it. You could just have everything is great up to that point and then just boom, something happens and it's just in the wrong spot. So my agent and I, we spent a lot of time crafting exactly what goes where with the flashback scenes and everything. I was, you know, at first, when I first outlined it, it was everything is in the past and everything is in the present. It's like, no, let's, let's mix it up a little bit. As I went back and reread, oh yeah, this is good. I like the way this is done. I think I'm going to do this from now on. You just earned your paycheck, Mr. Agent. <laughs> <laughs> um, how has writing this book and then promoting it felt? Um, just, I know you wrote it, everyone writes alone and you are no longer alone with this book. You know, how is this experience of getting blown across the country and, and highlighted and as I mentioned, uh, pretty much everywhere books are considered. How does that feel? Do you see this smile? <laughs> I feel like this smile is a permanent, it goes with my tattoo collection because it's just permanent. I don't think I can do anything but this. My face hurts so bad. I'm smiling <laughs> constantly. It has been, uh, I, when I wrote the book, I just wanted someone to like it. I just wanted one person to say, oh, that's a good story. That's all I wanted. This attention that it has garnered has been, uh, it, it's a blessing. It has been amazing. You know, people like you guys who are, I, I can't believe you guys are out on a beautiful day like this instead of being outside enjoying it. You're here listening to it. Why would you come here to listen to me? I don't get it, but I appreciate it. Don't get me wrong. Um, it is just, it's been phenomenal. Just the fact that it's gotten so much attention, I, I never would have thought. And I'm just, I'm pleased as punch. Well, that's really good. Um, so the competitions and performances and the other musicians that Ray encounters as he moves through all different levels of music uh, really brought me to understand the classical music scene kind of in a spiritual sense almost. Um, and I know a lot of it's your direct exper experiences, but I realized as I was coming through the book again and again and again, that it's almost these little vignettes of people Ray encounters that quickly give that whole complex entire world community. Um, it brings it to the reader pretty clearly. And I was wondering how you wrote that. What did you add? You know, write the a tryout scene and then add more people, or you know, how did you? technically or conceptually how are you able to construct that whole world for us to enter into it was quite easy to do because it all comes from direct experience i just basically wrote down like my my recollection of what happened to me um one instance where uh ray is yeah, about to perform 
you know, that's, I, I understand what it's like to the feeling right before, during, and after. I know exactly what it's like. So it wasn't uh, a, 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 a circumstance of me having to add people and take people away. It was just as it comes, just everything right off the top of my head. I've been carrying these stories around since I was nine years old, and I've been waiting to tell these stories, and it was just, okay, now I get to do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Every single person, every single event. And the funny thing, everybody in this book, I have actually met. These are real people. I know every single one of these people. Not by name, but I do know them. You know, you know how you, you, you know someone, you're like, yeah, I know that guy. Yeah, I, tell, I know 10 people just like that. That's what it was like. That was the experience of putting it down. It was actually quite easy to do. And I feel like the weight of the world has been lifted off of my shoulders and I can finally get this out. And it was, it was a lot of fun to do, actually. It was a lot of fun to write these things out. Even the painful ones, it was very cathartic because I actually got to get it out and release it and have someone validate my experience. So it was nice and you know, I made it into a book. So I was really happy about that. Too. Well, and in the author's note, you talk about how <clears throat> talking about some of your experiences, you're like, that didn't happen. And you know, having it in the book, not only is it with is the experience witnessed by so many people, but books just create so many conversations. And Very true. and especially this book, which I think will be such a great um book club book as as I think lots of heads nodding. Y'all know this is gonna be book club. <coughs> um you know when you collapse history like you do using a physical object of the violin that is truly traveled through time it kind of physically connects the hands who have held it. Um, and you know early in the book before we know too much of her personality there's a description of Ray's mother. Um, a slender woman, she likes looking good even now with her hair tied up in a scarf and wearing her favorite faded red t-shirt with property of North Carolina State University Athletic Department. <laughs> And I think I think this is a sentence that like students and teachers when they study it, it's are gonna be, you know, pitching it for essays and things. But as we've all been getting pumped about this book and um, talking about it in the store before it came out, the mother was who we ended up talking about. You know, people had you know this concept of this universal concept of parents not supporting their their child and in, in sometimes throwing hazards in their child's way and i'm wondering if you might be able to talk a bit more about the character of ray's mom who i know is not your mom thank you for saying that um, i know it's not your mom but just she's so important in the book and and i was just i'm curious and, and my colleagues and I, this is where we got we kept falling back to the the mother conversation so please um, mom's character is really interesting. If, how many of you have read the book? I'm just curious. Okay. okay. For those of you that have not read it, mom does not have a name. And I did that intentionally. And my, my editor was, it was a big fight. We need a name for mom. Like, no, you don't. It's, it's mom. That's all you need. And her character, um, it's, it's, um, she comes across as very unsupportive. Well, she just doesn't come across that way. She is very unsupportive, but the reasons that she is so unsupportive, that's, Kind of what I'm leaving it up to the reader to determine. Is it because she just wants to stand in his way to keep him from pursuing his dream just because she's a mean old lady? Maybe. Is it because she's trying to protect him? Maybe. She doesn't think that a uh, soloist career for her son is achievable and she wants to spare him the heartache. And, and that's the best way that she knows how to do it by discouraging him from doing it. That could be it as well, but I have to leave that up to you guys to determine from your reading. But uh, her character is really important because, you know, parents, I know you don't come when I'm not a parent, but you know, I have a couple and it doesn't, you don't come with a, a guy. It's not, you don't know what to do. It's trial and error. You learn, you learn by doing. And with, with this particular mom, I think that she did what she did the best way she knew how. I think that's what I'd like for people to take away from it. And you can make the determination what her rationale was um, as you're reading it. But, you know, mom was really important because that was a major obstacle in, in Ray's way. And he could have gone either way. He could have just totally rebelled. He could have just totally said, okay, you're my mom. I'll do exactly what you want. He could have gone either way. He could have, you know. So just read it and see what you think. I'm curious. I want to know what you guys think. I really do. I'm glad that you brought that up as a topic of conversation. 
I, look, I've been wanting to ask, and yes, that because you left it open for us to decide, and so that's what we are all coming to different conclusions on, and that's again why this is book club gold. Because it's it's you know like any good book, it's an airing of yourself more than anything else. The teachers in the book, and of course you are a teacher, but and I'm quoting the book here. We're here for a reason, to throw little torches out to lead people through the dark. And it's so good. And there's so much to talk about about teachers here. I know you have a teacher who's inspired you. We can talk about Dr. Stevens. We can talk about this quote or what it is, but um, I'm gonna choose your own adventure here okay, okay. under this topic. Something tells me that there are more than a few teachers in this audience. <laughs> How many of you are teachers or have been teachers? First, thank you guys so much. Thank you. You're just appreciated far less than you should be. Thank you so much for what you do. Um, the teachers in this book are some of the most important characters. And my, I, I really wanted to write this book to pay a tribute to my teacher, Dr. Rochelle Fetter Huang, who was my college teacher. Um, she taught me how to play the violin. She taught me how to teach everything that I do is based on what I learned from her. And I wanted to model, it was really easy to do, Dr. Janice Stevens in this book, who is Ray's mentor, is modeled after my violin teacher. And um, it's so funny when I let her read the manuscript, she just, I mean, she, she was just go, I can't, Brendan, I can't believe you remember that insight. The <laughs> <laughs> one, you taught me everything I know, why would I not believe, why would I not remember that? It, I, I really wanted to give people the sense that not only as teachers and educators, but just as general mentors, how important that is. That one teacher, all it takes is one person, one time to tell you that you can do something. And that's all it takes. I was on the verge of quitting. Ray was on the verge of quitting. And all it took was his teacher to just reaffirm that she believed in him. She knows that he can do this. Whatever you need, I'm here to support you. I will always be there to guide you. And that's all it took. Same thing for me. You know, I was ready to pack up and, and quit and just go home and I'm done. I can't do this. This is not the right career choice, choice for me. And when she, you know, she, my teacher personally called me and said, Brendan, yes, it was a bad performance that you gave, but we can do better. Let's take what we learned and we're gonna apply it to the next time you perform. And I knocked it out of the park the next time. I was like, okay, yeah, I'm good, I'm back, 100%, ready to do this. But had I had it not had her, had Ray not had her, Dr. his Dr. Stevens in the book, there's no way that he would have gone as far as he did. He was everything that she, she was everything that he needed, everything. And that's the sign of a good teacher. And you guys know that, you guys know that all it takes is one, one day, one smile, one handshake, one pat on the shoulder, to let people know that they are important. That's all it takes. And that's what Dr. Stevens is in the book for Ray. Um, I'm gonna ask one more question and then we are gonna open it up for audience questions. Um, I'll hand my mic to Katie and then maybe we can get that side of the room and, and then I'll take it back and get this side of the room for questions. But um, I assume many people here are not from North Carolina or did not go through their young education in North Carolina, um, but maybe fans of classical music. And I, I'm so much of your, of Ray's story has to do with a violin guy in his hands through school. And I was just curious, wondering if you could speak on and maybe Katie um, might be able to add to that. Just educate us a little bit about what 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 is music and arts in North Carolina school like of these days? And are there organizations that we should know about? You know, what's I can actually well in, in, in reference to the book, um, Ray is a violinist because of the public school music program. He is where he is today as a professional concert violinist because of a public school music program. And like myself, the only reason that I am sitting here today in front of you guys is because of the public school music program. It saves lives. It honestly does. Um, Cumberland County Schools is where I started. I went to Fayetteville, I was in school in Fayetteville. 
And um, just the fact that Susan Ellington came around with a violin and said, you can, you know, play free lessons, you just need to write an instrument. All right, I'll do it. It was a couple of my friends said they were going to do it. I was like, okay, cool. We get out of class twice a week. I am doing it. <laughs> you no, know, that's a typical fifth grader. And, and uh, my friends ended up not doing it, but I did do it. And it just, she saw something in me and it was fun. And I got the opportunity to see a symphony orchestra. I got the opportunity to play with other kids that were doing the same thing that I was. I got the opportunity to travel. I got the opportunity to go to college, to have experiences I never would have gotten. And just the arts in general are so important. Not everyone is on the doctor track. Not everyone is on the engineer track. Not everyone is on the lawyer track. Um, you know, there, there are things, there, the arts are so important. Creativity is so important. And we are constantly telling people that we need to foster creativity. But how do you do that when the, the programs that do that are constantly being cut in schools? You can't do it. It's, it's a possibility. So public school music saved my life. Public school music saved hundreds and thousands of lives. It is one of the most important things that you can it's one of the most important things out there. And I, uh, I'm i not really 100% on, up on what's going on with the school programs in North Carolina right now, but I will say to you guys, and can, you, can, you can speak more to this, if you know anyone sitting on the school board, if you know a principal, if you know a teacher, if you know parents who are involved in their children's music education or arts education, support them. Write a letter. Don't send an email. Write a letter. Get something physically in the hands of the people who are in charge of the administration. Let them know that you support public school music, public school arts, that it is so important to your kids. You want to foster their creativity. Not everyone is going to be a clone and say, okay, you're going to take, you know, this class and you'll take this class and then you'll go to a good college and you'll get a good job. That's not for everyone. And that's okay. That's the thing that we have to get out of that stigma that you have to do this, you have to do this. And if you don't, you're not successful. It's for everybody. I am living proof. You guys came here to see me and it's from public school music. And I, I can't thank you enough for that. And just any opportunity you get to show your support for an arts program, please do it. I'm a staunch advocate of it. And I'm living proof that it does work and it does save lives. <laughs> at this moment of advocacy because I have a direct follow-up, which is I am a violist myself. Brendan and I had a very similar upbringing and experience, and I'm in arts administration now. I came to Weymouth Center, and I was very eager to begin offering programming, artist visits, that kind of thing in the schools. I contacted the local school board, and I said, who is the arts coordinator in Moore County? Because there's one in Wake County, there's one in Cumberland County, there's one in every other county in the state almost. I moved to North Carolina to work for the North Carolina Symphony as their director of education. I was very accustomed to working with arts coordinators. There is not an arts coordinator in Moore County. It is combined into another position of like all, it's generalized into all after school programming, all testing, all anything else. So it's one of those bucket positions. So as you're writing your letter, please consider asking for an arts coordinator whose only job would be to make sure that all the schools have instruments, all the schools get a visit from the North Carolina Symphony, all the schools have a full-time music teacher, that would be their job. And so it, it, and it is the job of many other arts coordinators in many other counties in the state. And it was a decision that our school board has made in its funding choices. And so if you can include that in your letter, that would be a real movement, real movement in our county. We learned so much in author events. This is why it's good. But Y'all have got to be curious, and we're sitting here with Brendan Slogan. So, are there any questions that anyone would like to ask? I have tons more and can keep going, but since we're here together, if you have a question, I'd love to pass you the mic. Hi, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, I have a hundred questions. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> Just the first one is I noticed you have your um, the watch on your right. Are you left handed? I am not. I am right-handed. Okay, because I was going to ask you about the violin. I'm left-handed, and I find that 
I can't play any musical instrument, but you just haven't had the right teacher. But musical <laughs> appreciation, I love it. Yeah. The other question I have is I'm a writer and I write, but how long did it take you to write the book and how many, how many, um, <laughs> how long did it take you to book and how many um, copies did you make? How many? Oh, good question. Um, yeah. Okay, so first, with the watch on the right hand, I'm, I'm just right handed. I've always did because this is my bow hand, and, and I find it difficult to play. Okay. You know, with the watch is always. And I was really, really skinny. I know I'm skinny now, but I'm really skinny when I was growing up. And you know, the watch is constantly doing that, and it just didn't work. So I had to put it on my yeah. Um, yeah. And as far as the, the writing is concerned, don't don't hate me, but summer of 2020 is when I started writing this, and I was literally sitting at home eating and getting fatter and fatter and fatter and fatter and fatter and fatter. And fatter. So I actually saw uh, an advertisement as I was flipping through my computer between snacks. Going, uh, it said selling books in the age of COVID. So I submitted a draft of a science fiction novel that I'd written 20 years ago, which is really a good story, and I'm going to rewrite it one of these days. And um, I got a rejection letter, of course, and it said, "Yeah, this is a good story, but your writing is not great. But you got a good voice, and you should try writing what you know." Okay. And I know music, so I sat down, I wrote a chapter. And uh, the agent was like, this is good, sell it. Okay, right. Summer 2020, keep this in mind. It took me two and a half months. Wow. Three yes. drafts, just three drafts. I need that only because, no, 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 um, my, I, I block off basically four months just to write. That's all I do is, is write. So the second book is done. It took about three and a half months and I'm starting book three in June. And I hope to be done with that one by August, but it's all in my head. I'm super excited and I kind of write fast. So thank you. Thank you. Do you want? Yeah. Any other? Oh, yes. Uh, hi, I, I'm thrilled to see you. Uh, I actually have read the book, but it was sent to me by an old friend who's a 65 year old retired music educator. And he's always trying to get me more interested in music. And, and so he sent me the book as a gift. And he said about the book something that came to mind as soon as you said earlier that I think you've already sold the film rights or something. Right. He said, I think, I hope this book will be made into a film because I think it will do for the world of classical music what the Queen's Gambit did for the world of chess. And I thought, what a, what a recommendation. But the other reason he said, well, the book to me, and I really would love for you to take up my request. He knows I'm a real fan of great opening lines. And he said, I think you'll enjoy the way this book begins. And you know, one of the staples of great opening lines is a juxtaposition of the mundane with the extraordinary. And you do that really nicely with your earth shattering day and room service order. Uh, could you read the first two paragraphs? <laughs> and, and, and also, if you would, could you talk about why you chose that? It, it came to my mind when you said, you wanted to write a book that people would be eager to turn the page on. So if you do that, you would make my day. <laughs> First, what is your name, sir? Uh, Marty from Marty. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you very much. I have a website called greatopeninglines.com. Your, 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 no, no, your, your first two paragraphs are already there. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> that is awesome. Wow. Okay. Wow. All right. I don't have my glasses on, so if I jack something up, my apologies. You want to ah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 No. <laughs> <laughs> They're too strong. Oh. Oh. I, 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 I,
was just putting, oh, I'm going to go really close. Thank you. All right. Okay. On the morning of the worst, most earth shattering day of Raymond Hillen's life, he ordered room service, scrambled eggs for two, one side of regular bacon for Nicole, one side of vegan sausage for him, one coffee for Nicole, one orange juice for him. Later, he would try to second guess those choices and a thousand others that, in hindsight, vibrated in his memory. What if he'd ordered French toast instead of eggs? What if grapefruit juice instead of orange? What if no juice at all? <laughs> What's the story behind that? Anything? <laughs> it's it was it's second guessing, second guessing yourself because yeah. it's when the violin is stolen, when he realizes that it's stolen, it was it, it all goes back to a big, huge, overarching theme, overarching theme in the book. It's like Ray felt that he was unworthy because he lost the instrument. And what if I had just done something differently? Am I really that irresponsible, not worthy person that everyone keeps making me out to be? Do I really not deserve everything that I've got? And had I done something differently, would the outcome have changed? Maybe if I had gotten coffee instead of orange juice, maybe French toast instead of, maybe any little thing that would have Take made that much of a difference could have changed the whole outcome. So it was all about second guessing. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Marty, right? Yeah. Marty. It's my new friend, Marty, you guys. <laughs> hey, what's your website again, Marty? I'll send it. Thank you so much. We'll, we'll send it to all of you, actually. <laughs> right? You should send sign your first book. <laughs> I, I know I'm going to buy another one. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been such a pleasure. So thank you for being here. My question is about the Good Morning America selection. So I guess my question is, do you know what that process was for you to be selected? Did you, how far ahead of time did you know, or was the unveiling a surprise to you? And how much did that change your life? I mean, this is already a great book, but it's almost like Oprah's book club, or, you know, they've got so many different book clubs now. Um, how much, how life-changing was that for you to be selected for that? First, thank you so much for your kind of words. I really appreciate that. Um, okay, the GMA pick. All right, so it, this is it's kind of bittersweet um, because I actually found out about the Good Morning America pick nine months before the world. They they chose it nine months out, and my manuscript had just been approved. And um, my editor called me. He called me, and I hate to. Sorry, I apologize. Um, I lost my brother last year, and the day after the funeral, my editor called me and said, um, I, you know, I know you're in a bad place right now, but I just wanted to let you know that Good Morning America has selected your book, and I had to sit on that. I could tell no one oh. for nine months, and I just, I mean, da, 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 da. <laughs> for nine months, and it was just, it was it was it was mind-boggling. I couldn't believe it. You know, they they I, I I'm assuming that my my uh, publishing team sent it to GMA and they just yep okay we want this and that was amazing. It's just incredible to me. This whole journey is just insane. And the fact that they liked it enough to it's it's nuts. It is nuts. And I see this on TV and I go to New York and I'm like, all right, this is so awesome. And I'm li sitting with Lindsay Davis and she's talking and like we're all friends now. And like this is <laughs> this this whole thing is nuts. I just can't believe that you guys like this. I'm, I'm happy that you do. It's I never would have thought. I never would have thought. That's not why I wrote the book. I didn't write it so good morning America. I just wanted to tell a good story. That's all I wanted to do. And I'm just happy that it's happening. Yeah. Well, it's nice to see you, I guess. Very nice to see you, too. Um, I can actually see you. I'm close enough. <laughs> um, we had the pleasure, my husband and I had the pleasure of having you in our home on a number of occasions back in Alexandria, Virginia, as you instructed our son, Paul, Violet. So it's, we saw this in the paper and went, oh my God, you know, <laughs> we got to come. But to your writing, um, I do have a question. We know in art, we learn that there's so much intention when somebody paints a picture, there's so many representative signals in there. Talk about the names in your book and what do they represent? You know, you just, did you pull them out of the hat? You know, why is Ray called Ray? Um, I, 
appreciate the fact that mom doesn't have a name, but mom says so much. Mm -hmm. So maybe talk a bit about your um, selection of names. Absolutely. Lovely to see you guys. That was Paul's cool. But you, you ruined the violin for him because when you left, we could not find an instructor <laughs> to take your place. Oh, oh, oh. They loved you. Sorry. <laughs> um, the, the, the name question is awesome. Every single name in the book is someone that I, I know. Um, I used a lot of my old students. I used a lot of my friends. I used my family members. A lot of family, but Grandma Nora is my actual grandmother. Um, my uncle Thurston, he's my uncle um, uh, Ray in particular. That was an interesting one. Ray's full name is Raekwon, and that is not the typical name of a protagonist of a book. And I had a huge fight with my agent. He's like, I can't sell a book with a protagonist named Raekwon. And I was like, you know, that's all the more reason that we're going to keep it Rick one just for that reason. And it was a fight and I had to fight him on that. Like, no, this is what it needs to happen because we need to get out of the you know, stereotypical Peter, Paul, John, Mark, Michael. You know, we need to, it, there's so many, it's under, we're underrepresented. These names, thank you, exactly. Yeah, that's totally what it was. And it was a huge fight to do that. It's like, you know what, you're absolutely right. I had a student when I was teaching in Pennsylvania, his name was Rick Juan. And he was like, Mr. Slocum, please just, just call me Ray. Just, I hate Ray, just call me Ray. Okay, Ray. And I was like, that always stuck with me because he was a really good kid. So I was like, I'm going to use his name for the protagonist. Um, but the names, it just, you know, everyone is a real person. Every single person is real. And I wanted to include as many people that have uh, had an impact on my life as possible in this book. So from the attorneys to the family members to the kids around uh, to the quartet members to just everyone. Everyone is a real person that I drew, drew from my past experience. Great question. I see you, but I have to appear in the movie. <laughs> so excited to um, hear about your book. Um, four of us have already said we're going to buddy read this book and uh, get together and talk about it. But now I'm intrigued. What's book two about? <laughs> All right, glad you guys are sitting down. <laughs> one second. First, can I thank you all one more time for coming out? Yeah. Thank you guys so much. I mean, I, you know, I just sound like a broken record. I, I can't explain to you how much I appreciate all of this support. I have a tattoo that says thank you that shows my gratitude every single day for every single thing that has been bestowed upon me and I'm serious in this. So I get to look at it every day and show my gratitude. So thank you again. Question was, I forgot. Book two. Book two. <laughs> Book two, the manuscript is turned in. It's being edited right now. Uh, Frederick Delaney is the world's most well-known composer. Everyone across the world knows his music. He's bigger than Bach, bigger than Beethoven, bigger than Mozart, everyone knows him. His 150th anniversary, is coming up. So his family that runs his foundation, you know, 100 years later, 150 years later, they are throwing a huge worldwide gala that's going to be televised in every language across the world. They hire a musicologist to do extensive research on Delaney and his music to do for the presentation um, for his gala. The musicologist discovers that Maybe Frederick Delaney didn't write any of his music and that it could have been appropriated from a black woman who we know would be living with autism today. And the family will stop at nothing to make sure this information stays in I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I got to do snippet book three. Just, just you guys are the first ones that are going to hear, don't tell anyone. <laughs> Seriously, don't tell anyone. Well, take it to our All right, all right. Until the, until the, oh, um, for three. There's, this, I haven't come up with a name yet. There's this guy who plays cello. He's got really, really, really bad anxiety. He goes to a hypnotist. Doesn't work. He goes to another hypnotist. Doesn't work. He goes to a third hypnotist. Doesn't work. He's like, all right, whatever. I got to perform performs with a string quartet. He's playing the Death of the Maiden Quartet by Schubert. He hits the low D, 
all of a sudden he experienced just, just euphoria just washes over him. He doesn't remember anything. He wakes up in some lady's bed. Oh, okay, well, um, thank you, ma'am. I'm going to go home now. He goes home, reads the newspaper review. It's one of the best performances anyone has ever seen. The cello stood out. Great. All right, cool. Does it again next week. Plays the same performance. Hits that low D. Same experience of euphoria. Doesn't remember anything. This time he wakes up at home. Ooh, all right. Gets up to go practice, turns the TV on, oh, something, some special news report about something happening, doesn't really pay attention to it. Goes to practice, sees that there's blood on his cello case. Oh. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> well, that is book three, so I'm really excited to get started right now. I know, right? It's going to be good. Yeah, good stuff. I'm sorry. Yeah. My question is, you, how did you go about finding Brandon? Brendan and his book to bring him to Wallace. I mean, the books were always picked straight off. So. so part of the way, you know, the question about the Good Morning America and, and how long ahead of time you did that, part, part of why the people are reading so far ahead of time is that book club enthusiasm. And thankfully, publishers still listen to bookstores, which, you know, you look, which is huge. That, that they they care because without their support and your support, you know, it all works together in in constant. Oh, um, right. But so we are reading way ahead of time all the time and giving feedback. This so sometimes when we're really lucky, we get so GMA gets the manuscript the second you drop it in. Sometimes. And it's always like gold. This maybe happens once a year. Beth Carpenter behind has gotten a manuscript. I've gotten a manuscript. Angie Talley gets manuscripts. And then we're reading basically the word document, super unedited. Um, next comes like a galley, which is a, you know no cover at all, just a piece of paper, but it's actually book shape. Um, then the arc, which is for promotion. So this is going to go out to newspaper, all the reviews. The people who are reviewing this is this and in it it'll have um some so this is a the editorial director you can see on my notes but the editorial director has like a promotional um you know dear reader it'll have um quotes this, these are in-house quotes from people at the publisher the uh oh valerie sweet valerie it's regional sales director um library marketing adult field sales um you know in-house enthusiasm other ones um, I got to read an early copy of the new Sarah Addison Allen that uh, comes out September 13th. And so that gal has just been printed and it has our quote in it. So we are reading constantly. And if we are pumped about a book, Beth read this book first, came in, we were telling Brenda this earlier, I was on the phone or doing an order and Beth just goes, I was on the phone. She goes, incredible, read this book. <laughs> and then like turned around and walked out. And that's a bit of, that's the, and when we read a book, you know, when y'all see our staff picks, when we're bringing authors in, the the months and weeks of enthusiasm and passing it around, you know, I, talk, I asked about the mom, it's because we've been talking about her for months. And this is why by the time we get to this moment, by the time your publicist is great, that I've been chatting with the publicist and pitching, I mean, we are so pumped for this book to be in your, your hands. And we don't, you know, our local authors, we we just, the community that's here is huge. And then being able and, and supporting our local authors, but finding gems and being able to track them down is huge. And I have to tell y'all, you know, I did my spiel at the beginning, thanking y'all for being here. Publishers send us authors because y'all show up. Publishers send us authors because y'all buy books. We've, we've been able, you know, when Amar Tolls came and I had begged and it was because we sold so many books and I was like, we will deliver, we will deliver. And they, they said, okay, we'll, we'll trust you. Uh, and of course, we have a former bookseller who's in New Orleans. We sold, we had more people, we sold more books than they did in New Orleans in, in our small town. And y'all know that's literally because of y'all. <laughs> Thank you. It's because y'all show up. Really? That's nice. No, thank you. I wonder if I They passed me. I also read the book. The most fun part for me was small, the details. You know, the things that I don't know about. And one of them was when he was um, grooming himself to have a style 
with his, his tux and the pink rose. Do you have one of those uh, style type things? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I do personally, but a lot of the people in the orchestras that I play with, they are all got to be this, got to wear a tuxedo, got to wear a bow tie, got to do this, but I am a sock aficionado. <laughs> One of my camos today, normally it's it's polka dots or uh, argyles, or it's always about the socks. So when I'm playing and my, my tuxedo is up to here, I make sure that the other tuxedo is fine. What is he going to be wearing this time? It's always, you know, it's, it's a tux and whatever color socks Fred wears today. And I, I try to get the other people in my section to do this. There are not a lot of guys that play violin in the orchestra that I'm at. So whatever pair of socks that I buy, I always buy like two or three extra pairs so we can kind of. Oh, that's a great question. So we have Dottie's question and then is any more because we're at, right at the hour. All right, before we leave, be sure to tell people about pages in that time. Yes. Um, so question and question. I have I have two things. First of all, yes, you mentioned Schubert and you're gonna have to write that book second instead of first. <laughs> Schubert's been my favorite book. And then also but yesterday, just yesterday afternoon, right where you are, yeah. uh Kevin Lawrence was here uh playing the violin and Dimitri Steinberg playing the piano, and they did the most incredible Schubert. And I just thought that. Kevin Lawrence, he, he was just going to pass out afterwards because it, it, it gets so exciting mm -hmm. and then it all back to all that. So, you know, I, I think it's so neat that you're talking right now, just the day after they played Schubert right here. One of my favorites, too. Absolutely. The second thing is that I want to know what's your style of writing? James Boyd, the writer who lived here and his study was upstairs, he has a stand up desk. So he stood up all the time. And he also had writer's cramps, so he didn't write. And he dictated at first to a secretary and then starting his second novel, he dictated to a dictaphone. And we actually, uh, Mariana has a, found a picture, a press release photo of him talking to the dictaphone. So, and his daughter uh, has mentioned in notes that she uh, has given to him years ago that her father would talk out loud in the different voices as he would. So, you know, they would hear these strange voices all over the house. So, what is your sound right? Do you ever talk out loud? Do you ever do anything like that? Do you sit up, stand, sit up? Stand. This is a bit crazy. Um, I am an all over the place person. I'm very, I'm very, uh, Tactile, so I am just all. I'm on my couch like this, and then I'm on the couch like this, and then my legs are up on the back of the couch like this. Like every 20 minutes, I change position, and then when I'm about to come to the end of my writing session, I go to my office and I just sit and I just, you know, just blow it out for the last like 15, 20 minutes or so. So I'm all over the place. I just have to. I'm in a hundred different positions at the right. <laughs> I, I do what, whatever I'm doing. I stop if it's here. I stop, and I, I, I you know, I used to be one of those people. Ah, I'll just remember it later. Oh, no, no, no. But <laughs> I lost so many ideas doing that one too many times. I said, you know, like last month for book four, I would, it was like three in the morning, and it's like. Am I going to remember? You know what? I got to get up and write. But I got up, went to my computer, and I wrote down the premise for my my fourth book. I sent it to my agent. This is fantastic. Where'd you come up with this? Oh, I just woke up in the middle of the night. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm just all over the place, and wherever it hits me, I, I have to do it right then. Good question. Quick question on uh, on violinist who has a rock band. Can you tell me about your rock band? <laughs> I am the singer and keyboard player in a rock band called Geppetto's Wood. Um, and I know, right? I know, right? Um, it's, it's just, I'm the songwriter for the band, and, and it's, uh, we've been together probably 12 years now, and it's just, it's fun because the, the, the group members are actually former students of mine who are adults now, and we just, we have a connection. I know that they're good musicians because I taught them. Um, and we, we, we click and it's so much fun. And I write the songs and I'm like, hey guys, you like this one? Yeah, okay, we'll do this one. I think they're afraid to, to say they don't like anything because they, they still look at me as a teacher. <laughs> and like, we'll take a break and, and they'll get a beer. What are you doing? Oh, wait a minute, you're not 15 anymore. Okay. <laughs> I don't know, but yeah, it's, it's 
fun. We, we go out and perform it. It's a good time. And actually, I know I don't sound like I'm a singer, but I actually did kind of decent singer. Are any of those songs on YouTube? No, nah, well, there's most. There's a couple of videos on YouTube, but don't go. Where do you perform? In Washington, D.C. Oh, okay. Yeah. Maybe just... you take it on the road and come down here. There we go. <laughs> you know what? Done. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here. Before we move to our next part, I, I have um, your attention still. So I am going to let you know about a couple things coming up. Um, one, we have a couple writers here, and I mentioned how strong our local writing community is, especially after the pandemic, as people were sitting at home and decided not to eat and decided to write. So to that end, Weymouth, um, the Southern Pines Library and the Country Bookshop have partnered together to have a festival called Pages in the Pines, and it is for our local writers. Um, a night of networking, then a day um, of a festival at the library to have your books um, to the community, and then a workshop on Sunday. So uh, tell your friends or our writers who are in the audience, please participate. Um, that's coming. I want to let you know that Pilot Radio is, uh, this is Frank Daniels, who has been recording this. And um, if you don't know about Pilot Radio, go to the website, check it out. Also, this is the first live event that will also uh, be part of the podcast that I'm turning these conversations into, or I should say, Frank is turning these conversations into. Yeah, Frank. We, 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 that's right, the, the we. Um, I want to let y'all know, so if y'all are familiar with AIMS, Authors and More Schools, that Angie Talley, um, our children's department, started, and she is who is getting authors and books in kids' hands all over the county, all over our surrounding counties, and you can always support that. Um, I'll include a link to it, but uh, for your book, because it's awesome and inspiring and just should be in everyone's hands, um, Ames is partnering with the Arts Council of Moore County's PAMS, who love our acronyms, Performing Arts in Moore Schools, um, on this event. So students at the orchestra programs at Moore County's three public high schools will be provided with digital access to this recording. Um, and Ames and PAMS have coordinated with each school's media center to provide copies of the books. Um, we're starting at six at each school, one at the media center, and five to distribute. Um, and also, students in the Orchestra Center can either purchase the book at a discounted price supplemented by the nonprofit or write a 150 word paragraph on the theme, How Music Changed My Life, and receive a free copy. Um, so. <laughs> to uh, end with that, because, you know, this is what. The bookshop's about, this is what Weymouth is about, this is what coming together around music is about, and I just want to thank you for being here, and thank you all for being here, and for reading, and, and supporting the bookshop, and getting pumped about awesome books, and I can't wait to come back. Would it be possible for me, those that you do choose to read the essays, I'd love to read them. Done. Thank you. So, yay! Signed books. Um, yeah, I didn't ask you. I would get a pen. No, I got it. And um, then, in that way, if you have your book and need to go, you can exit that way. Demita, uh, birthday girl, uh, will be birthday lady. Will be out there if you want to get more books for presents. And thank you. Thank <laughs> you.